Uh, we are going to talk about uh, our uh, maybe more immediate environment and the visible and the maybe not so visible parts of it. And we will start with um, uh, one very visible communication system which has been installed in France in the end of the 18th century. It's the Chappé system, which consisted of about like more than 500 uh, towers that had like uh, moving limbs. So you could actually communicate through those 500 towers and send messages. And it was, there, obviously there have been uh, many more examples even earlier than that. Uh, what's interesting though to see that, that that's a, this has been really like deployed statewide. So it basically comprised a, an area of almost 5,000 kilometers. And you could, you could send uh, messages, which back in the days were of course obviously used for like political power. I mean, it was wartime, so France had to defend itself from all his uh, nasty neighbors. And um, information was, in a way, gold. I mean, you could, uh, by having access and by having um, um, advance in uh, information and how it passes, you, you had actually political power. And so we are kind of fascinated by all these uh, examples and if you if you start digging into the history you find lots of them and um, I'm introduced to uh, Bank Sjöln so he is from Stockholm <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is uh, this is a telephone tower uh, in Stockholm it's one of several that was in Stockholm uh, it was built in 1887 um, and this particular tower connected 5,500 uh, phone subscribers with visible phone lines, each of them going to one subscriber and their phone. Uh, so it's very transparent uh, and visible infrastructure. It's actually a lot more transparent and visible here than uh, it normally was, I guess, because this picture is from winter, so you have ice and snow on the, on the cables. It was only used for 25 years or, or so, before, because after that, all the cables were actually underground. Uh, but it stayed for, for a long time, still, the tower itself. So you, you see we're in the end of the 19th century and uh, basically there is this shift between um, having wired and wireless communication protocols. And this is still a wired map. You see it's the famous all red line. It was basically implemented by the British uh, peril system like to connect all the colonies together. And so it was maybe, as, as you have seen with Daniel's um, slide about the submarine cable net, it's, it's basically the, the first version, it's the first draft, right? It's this version 0 0.1 of, of a submarine cable net. And, and again, the idea was, okay, we, we can communicate, we know what's, what's going on in, in all those colonies, and um, there is a, a, a political advance uh, by doing that. So um, this is like the contemporary version of it. It's a fascinating thing. These um, infrastructures, they always have like um, they are, they're they're state owned, privately owned, and they're they're far from any anything from like freedom of speech and freedom of the internet and, and stuff like this. This is a heavily corporate space we are enacting in. Still, like being fascinated about visibility of, of all those things, we see here this is an exit hub when the, when a fiber optic cable comes out of the sea in, in into a building, and it's it's not so spectacular actually, but it's just the cable, right? Um, um, this is a work done by Terence Simon, a photographer who, who did a, a, a sort of research on, onto that. Um, if you're really into it, you, I can recommend you Armand Matla, who was uh, basically describing the mo monopolization of, of communication infrastructure and the deployment throughout history. So it's going from the 18th century up until the 2000s. Basically what we have is the product of a, of a globalized world uh, of very specific Western interest with, with, with the communication infrastructure we have now. Um, out of a sudden we, we had like uh, wires everywhere and if you've seen the, the Stockholm Tower we had like very visible lots of wires. Lately we are all connected wirelessly and we, we have electric fields all around us. Uh, basically when I talked about the, the visible towers in the Chappé system, like light is an electromagnetic wave, right? Um, so the visible light is just like a tiny spectrum of what actually electromagnetic fields uh, look like. This is, uh, yeah, we're now transitioning from cables and wires to, to wireless in a sense. And uh, when looking at wireless and radio, it's based on, on physical phenomena uh, like 
electric fields and magnetic fields. And this is an example of, uh, like, that you practically can see sort of with an electric field. Maybe you shouldn't do this to your cat, but, but uh, static ele ele electricity is what makes styrofoam beads uh, stay on things. You could have a balloon that is charged, for example, you can bend uh, uh, water coming out of the tap with that, which is things that you can easily test. Magnetic fields, of course, you know very well in that you can, yeah, you can feel the force of them, you can move uh, things of iron, and you can actually see the shape of field by putting uh, iron powder on a, on a, like a glass plate, for example, and putting a, a magnet underneath. But uh, Maybe we should have warned you, so like whatever image search you will do on electrostatic and electromagnetic fields, you will get this as a first result. <laughs> Um, and this is the second result. But that is, the electrostatic fields and the magnetic fields are static fields. They are not changing. In the uh, 19th century, there was a lot of investigation into trying to understand what electricity and magnetism was and, and how they worked and interacted together. <coughs> James Clerk Maxwell put together a lot of the research of others and did a lot of research himself. But it was uh, people like Gauss and Ampere and Hertz and Faraday uh, working on these, these things. Uh, already in 1860, uh, James Clerk Ma Maxwell published a paper, not this one, this is actually on like, uh, basically the whole interaction between uh, <clears throat> yeah, electricity and ma magnetism. But already in 1860, uh, he, he published a paper uh, where he uh, proposed that it would be possible to send something equivalent to to radio and even computed the, the speed that it would, these waves would propagate in uh, as being quite close to what we now know is the speed of, speed of light. And <clears throat> the thing with, with these, these fields that is critical here for radio is that uh, different from the static fields of static magnetism or static uh, electric fields, if you change an electric field, that will produce a magnetic field. If you change a magnetic field, that will produce an electric field. Um, so these interact and propagate one creating the other continuously. If we look at those fields of propagation, when, when you have change, you have change at a frequency. And uh, to us now, it's not strange that it is possible to, uh, to send electromagnetic waves because we live in a, in a world where we're quite used to uh, receiving electromagnetic waves, since light is electromagnetic waves, it's just a different frequency or different wavelength than, than what we call radio um, or uh, what is X-ray or, or uh, radioactivity in the form of, of gamma rays. <coughs> One early radio telegraph system that is also a very, very visible object, uh, uh, Grimaton in Varberg in Sweden, uh, it's one of nine such systems built in the 20s around the world, early 20s. Um, each of these towers is 127 meters tall. Uh, there's a two kilometer long antenna sitting on top of these towers. And it was used for sending very low frequency signals across the globe, across the Atlantic. And uh, for example, during the, uh, the Second world, world War, when all the telegraph, uh, like the submarine telegraph links were were cut. For Sweden, this was the only way to communicate with over the Atlantic. It is, this is the only system remaining today, and it's actually in functional condition, and one day every year they do transmit on 17 kilohertz, and that supposedly can be received over most of the world. You can get the idea that it is hard to actually transmit something. People actually, I mean, people tried a long time to be able to transmit things and receive them, but in fact, it's harder not to transmit. Any changing electric current uh, produces an, a, a, a changing magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field, which becomes a propagating radio wave. So every signal that changes direction or does anything uh, in uh, a wire or on a circuit board will, would also uh, transmit a radio wave. So all our devices, uh, in some sense, they, we have, they have an, an an aura, if you say, of all the activities going on inside, transmitting uh, <clears throat> waves that represent the processing that they're doing inside. And the only case that they would be electromagnetically silent would be when they're static, when they're not doing anything. And this is a project from 2013 that 
actually was uh, developed here in in, uh, in Ljubljana at the residency I had in Ljudmila and shown at Axioma in 2013 as well. It's called Tempest Aura, and what what it is is basically a scanner for for seeing electromagnetic fields emanating from devices. A surface where you can put a device, and it would would then scan with a a receiver building up an image of different signal intensities and, and frequencies uh, emanating from the device. Bank mentioned actually it's, it's really hard to, to not transmit everything electrical we interact with and everything we do even on our computers. Um, basically the, the information we are um, perceiving uh, is, is directly proportional to, to its electromagnetic uh, um, um, field. And this obviously has been um, studied as well by uh, surveillance agencies like a long time ago. You see in 72, uh, there was a classified program uh, that was called Tempest. And this was exactly de uh, dealing about um, um, this issue that uh, uh, any time a machine is used to process classified information, classified information electrically, the various switches, contacts, relays, and other components in that machine may emit radio frequency or acoustic energy. And so uh, this was actually the starting point of an investigation we did together with Danya and, uh, and, and Banked in Berlin, where we, we tried to look at the, a keyboard and we really wanted to see, is that actually, is that, is that true? Is, is it possible to capture uh, um, um, stuff we are emitting, uh, interacting with? So we tried with like a one, me one meter copper antenna to, to um, detect some keystrokes, first with the oscilloscope, and then we, well, Basically, it's, it's, it's very hard to kind of interpret uh, what you're measuring because you're also, like by measuring uh, within that system, you're being, becoming an actor as well and influencing the system. So what we did, like what, what you usually do is like you make audio recordings and you can actually just like by looking into these waves and changing waveforms, you can detect um, rising and falling edges. So basically, this was a recording done um, like next to the keyboard, like one meter away, with a, just with a copper antenna, and we were able to, to detect which key has been pressed from, from remote. So this has huge consequences, and this was also that what Tempest was, was dealing with, is like how can we actually prevent it? Well, obviously, if you look at a banking machine and an ATM, you see it's like a heavy machinery and heavily grounded, actually to prevent the leakage of any information, because you can imagine like the number pad could be easily um, um, detected from remote. The hard stuff is actually how can we visualize um, our electromagnetic environment, right? I mean, we, can, we, ha we have an idea, like, okay, we, we can pinpoint a router in the room, but we, we cannot imagine how this router is connected to our phone. I mean, it's, it's not a straight line, but it's, it, it takes uh, heavy, uh, complex parameters inside to to actually make this link uh, uh, possible. But one project that uh, Bank was involved uh, was the Wi-Fi Camera Obscura. Um, the idea with the Wi-Fi Camera Obscura was to imagine how it would be if we could actually see um, radio waves uh, at the frequency of, of Wi-Fi, because um, even at the time, I mean, this is a long time ago, in 2006, but uh, even at the time, of course, uh, when you were, were outside, you would see hundreds of, of networks and uh, were quite quite dependent on the infrastructure but you could not see the infrastructure but in some sense was some places would be warm and welcoming where you were online and uh, some places would be cold and barren where you could not find any any con connection um, and in some sense you could also argue that that we happen to see the wavelength that we call light instead of other wave wavelength is is just because evolution has shaped us that way uh, you could imagine a scenario of evolution that would have made us see other wavelengths and, um, and other frequencies. This is one of the incarnations of the Wi-Fi camera. This is called the panoramic Wi-Fi camera. It spins around and takes a panoramic picture continuously of the space you're in. This is like, I think, the third variant of it. This project was going on for several years, building different experience, uh, experiments. This picture is from it's from ICC in Tokyo, where you have a space with a lot of pillars, um, and you also have a microwave oven in the kitchen next to it, and when they turn on the microwave oven, all the, the picture turns all white, because the microwave is leaking so much stronger than all the networks are. It's another older visualization where you can see different networks 
like the furthest picture is a, a, a light sensor picture. So that is an actual photograph. All the others are different networks and how they uh, are received in, by the projection that the, the camera itself captures. So you could see, for example, how a network would uh, come in through a window, be reflected on a radiator, and, and then be reflected, sort of light up the floor, for example. Or you could see, you could see the, the bars in a window being sort of uh, darker. What we are showing here now at Axioma. The idea with packet bridge, actually Brücke means bridge. Our initial idea was if we imagine that I don't know, all this Wi-Fi environment around us is actually constituting another form of architecture, let's say that, like provo provocatively, what will happen if we try to swap um, these locations? And, and in a way, um, what popped up was like, that is also the, tit the talk of the title was, in, uh, it was titled uh, Electromagnetic Situationism, it's like psychogeography, like swapping um, spaces and looking at actually at, at, at signs and situations rather than like uh, b based on the behavior of, 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 of the person. So what, what we really tried to do was, okay, we were looking again in, at the Wi-Fi spe uh, spectrum. This is the installation you're going to see tomorrow and, and, and explore. But uh, looking at the Wi-Fi spectrum, it has 14 different channels. Um, and they are basically just like on different frequencies. Yeah. The number 14 is just important because as you count, can count up here, we have 14 different routers. What they do is actually they, they just like uh, try to um, suck the beacon frames that are in the air at one location and then transfer it through a tunnel, not the VPN tunnel yet, um, to another part in the world where the installation is placed and is being replaying these beacon frames, these Wi-Fi beacon frames. How does that look like for uh, a place like uh, Kino Shishka? So basically my, my computer is in monitor mode. He's listening to, uh, to what's happening uh, around us and we will see pop up. Um, actually, I'm limiting it to only one channel because otherwise the list would be almost, uh, it would be too long to scroll because like, there are, so many access points and, and, and stuff, uh, um, 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 spoiling the, uh, spilling into the ether. And uh, the interesting thing is like actually the second part of the screen on the vertical side is actually all those uh, devices who are sending out probes, like and trying maybe to look for the last access point they connected to. In some sense, you could argue that we, the Wi-Fi networks and the Wi-Fi environment available in space uh, could somehow be interpreted as the look and feel of that space. In, like if you look through at the space through your your phone or your computers, like where you see the networks available when you try to connect to them, you would see networks that does not exist in the space that you are. You would see networks that are from another location, uh, basically like folding the map or transferring you into. Uh, how it would be if you were at that location. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea is yeah, to transfer one, the electromagnetic presence of one location into another, to sort of invade one space with, uh, with the presence of another. Uh, and one consequence of that uh, is that, that systems that use what networks they see uh, get tricked and confused as well. And one such system is the uh, Wi-Fi positioning systems. Um, Normally, we, I mean, when we look at like location services and positioning, we talk about GPS. And with GPS, we don't even only mean GPS, but we need GLO mean GLONASS and Galileo. There are several satellite-based systems um, that we use for computing our location on the surface of this planet. But uh, those systems only work when you're outside, actually, because uh, you need to have a reception from, well, it could work if you're close to a window. But you need to have a continuous reception from at least four different satellites in different locations so that you can compute the time difference between the signals and then from that compute your location. And when you have a location when you're inside, it's actually the Wi-Fi networks that are used, the Wi-Fi networks that your device sees. And the way this works is that people build up big databases of locations of uh, Wi-Fi base stations. They do it by uh, what is called war driving which basically means just driving around, scanning, uh, and logging all data, and building huge databases of that. But they also uh, do it by having people's devices scan for, for networks and uploading 
what they see, so they can build their database of that when they know, they know their location. And then that database itself can be used such that when your device uh, looks at what networks it sees in its location, it will upload it to the server. The server will look, okay, we see these networks. We know where they are, so we approximate your location based on, on that and feed it back to you. But what happens then when we pollute the space with networks that are not there, that are supposed to be in another place, then we get, I mean, we get transferred to um, the other location. So that could be like Seoul or um, like in, in Berlin, um, we would swap places within the same city, like swapping our studio with House of Culture and the Welt. Every single device, every single computer you have or every single network uh, interface you, you own has a unique number. And that's how, how the system also looks at. They're not looking at the names of the Wi-Fi networks. They're actually looking at their, their MAC address. And um, uh, so what happens is if you're taking a photo on Instagram, it will It will, it will point you to another location, or if you if you go to Google Maps, you will end up uh, sometimes flying from your real location to the spoofed one, and and going back and forth. Uh, it goes the other way as well, of course, because when we when we use these services, when our devices use these services, because they don't actually tell us how it works, and when we have networks uh, with names on them. Uh, We don't get to opt in. People build their data the databases based on the signals that we see anyway. But the networks that are present will help update the base of database. So when we pollute the space, we also pollute the database. So I think we will see effects of that during the, or we, we have clear hints that we will see effects of that during uh, the exhibition starting tomorrow, that, that what we have been doing in, uh, Rijeka, for example, has polluted the, uh, the databases of the service providers that our devices use and shifts location, make networks seem like they are in another location where, uh, than where they originally were. This brings up a, a, a part of the manifesto we, we wrote is that the critical engineer deconstructs and insights suspicion of rich user experiences. And every time we use actually a, a, a geolocation uh, service, we should, we should like, I, not every time, but we, 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 we can think, okay, how, is that actually, is that my real location or can, how, how easy is it actually to man, manipulate uh, stuff like this? And if you think of like, uh, like driving your car and, or, or, or walking around, you will, you will be dependent upon these systems. Here we, you see us in action uh, trying to sniff uh, some of the networks with uh, some sort of mobile uh, paquet uh, uh, device, an artwork that is basically talking almost all the time about wirelessness, right? It's actually lots of wires, which is somehow weird. Actually, the, the crazy effect of, of polluting the Wi-Fi space is that what uh, we did in, in Rijeka was that our machine was like uh, sending beacon frames from Seoul or from, from Ljubljana, from uh, Lyudmila. And uh, when we uh, switched Paketbrücke on here, actually it was pointing us to back to Rijeka. So we actually already changed the kind of the electromagnetic uh, uh, or the, the, the Wi-Fi uh, sphere of Rijeka because now in the database our networks which we polluted um, they are pointing to that space, to Drugomore. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's also a disclaimer for, for today. If you look at any technological object you have you will see that actually the CE logo is on it. But um, what we are going to address also, and you will have the chance, some of you will have the chance tomorrow to attend the workshop, is like that critical engineering is also very much about collective engineering. So it's about um, transferring of, of, of knowledge and we have summer intensives and winter intensives. And uh, as, as you've seen, um, all of us are also teaching that stuff and that's also an, a very essential part to do it together and uh, so we have like a uh, uh, couple of times workshops here in, in Slovakia you see one and here uh, was an antenna workshop I did in Hong Kong where we started to like just with copper wires try to um, to sniff around with a cheap uh, USB dongle um, uh, something into like which is called software defined radio so you can actually 
open up and look uh, much further uh, in a much further spectrum of frequencies uh, than just the Wi-Fi frequencies. Uh, we have here also an antenna workshop that Banked was uh, building up in Berlin and Tempelhof. It's a double, yeah, double yeah. cross dipole antenna for receiving weather satellite images. Um, so you have also like uh, a critical engineering forum you can you can check out. Finally, we we just want to try to do an experiment. We're gonna um, let you know how that how how it feels like if you listen to weather satellite. So. Basically, the interesting thing is they are pass they're really fast. So they are flying about 600 kilometers an hour, um, very much up in the sky. And you have, uh, at certain points at the day, you have actually the chance to just to listen of one of these. And that's what we are trying to do now. So what you're hearing is actually basically the tuner being set up in a certain frequency and uh, based just on a dipole antenna based uh, made out of uh, electric wires um, in the right angle with a USB dongle. And basically this image is, uh, this is real time. So it's, um, this is public domain. You can just like, you know, grab it out of the, I mean, you have to be outside, you can't be inside of a building. But this is a, somehow a fascinating thing that, that basically with the right form or like the right antenna shape, you can tune into different spectrums of, of, of what we have seen. I mean, us as a human, we are just tuned into, into visible light, right? We can only see what we, we see, but our machines are capable of, of, of tuning really into, into, weird, uh, into weird spectrums. What we were listening to was the image and the picture being shown is decoded from that sound. So it's one and the same. Yeah, about antenna designs, that is, uh, it's, it's voodoo, it's black art in some sense. It's black um, magic, totally. <laughs> exactly. But um, there's also, I mean, one, one thing that I find very interesting is that, that there's a, a very direct connection between uh, physical form and function and at high frequencies, for example, if you want to do uh, a resistor on a circuit board, it's just a thin trace of copper. If you want to do a coil, that's a spiral. If you want to do a capacitor, which like the capacitor, capacitor symbol is like two um, plates with a gap in between, and a capacitor in high frequencies on copper on a circuit board is just a trace with a gap in it. Um, signals being coupled across because of uh, fields stretching and inducing currents in, in uh, the copper next to it. And another such example of like a physical manifestation of the radio wave where form has function is this thing, which is a UMTS cavity duplexer filter. It could actually be a diplexer as well. It's a channel uh, within an aluminum box with precise proportions where an antenna would be connected at one point and a receiver and transmitter at two other points. And by how the wave travels through this and how there's little conductors between different parts of the channels connecting, like bridging over this meandering channel, they would make very precisely signals cancel out or amplify so that uh, none of the energies that is supposed to, uh, well, that comes from the transmitter can go to the receiver so that these can all be mixed to the same antenna. But it's very much like all this function is it's in its physical shape. And if you change the form of it, you change its, its properties. So it's, I mean, it's very, 
very direct in a way, uh, even though it's very hard to design and understand how, how it actually works. And yeah, UMTS, that this is part then of a mobile phone base station with the UMTS standard. So actually, um, th this, is, this is a Nokia systems uh, uh, UMTS base station. So uh, they might actually be sitting all around on, your, on the houses here as well. Another such uh, manifestation of the shape of the waves are, are these helical antennas, uh, which are designed to receive circularly polarized waves, that is, waves that turn as they progress. Uh, and you can see the shape of that in the antenna as well. Uh, of course, this um, object also uh, very, very clearly points at something. So, you, I mean, you understand the function of just looking at it, that it will follow a satellite in the sky and receive a signal from it and communicate with it. So if you're going back to the historical example we showed in the very much beginning of the 18th century about the light towers and sending information uh, from one tower to the other one uh, through the line of sight, actually we, we still can, we can still um, explore these manifestations of, of, of technological infrastructure. So this on the left side is a communication microwave network uh, on short wave that has been built between New York and Chicago. So the idea was to have like really fast communication exchange between the two stock exchanges. And um, basically these were huge uh, infrastructural projects. And maybe you have also heard about like in the last, in the, in the last decades that high frequency trading uh, became uh, a very big thing, so where basically the milliseconds, uh, if you know uh, how much the price will be on another stock exchange between Chicago and New York, you could actually bet on shares and you can make actually pro pro uh, profit because everything is being algorithmically set. And these are huge under undertakings, so basically there, there was private company then again building a fiber optic cable between New York and Chicago, which was following the, the straightest line possible. Uh, to gain two milliseconds, and which was immediately obsolete after two years because they were implementing a, a microwave communication network um, that was again three milliseconds faster. Uh, and here, these are some towers that popped up uh, again close to the Chicago Exchange, working on short wave. So just again, what Banked uh, was showing that the form actually by just looking at that, you can actually get an idea of, well, where does it point to? Uh, what kind of signal might does it carry? And w where does it communicate with? And then um, this brings me to an idea that, uh, to talk about field guides. Like the idea of a field guide was to learn, you know, species, uh, plants, um, animals, uh, stones even, uh, which you can find in the nature. So I think it's, it's an urge to call for having an antenna field guide. Like, uh, because we are, in our immediate environment, we are like surrounded by those things, which we can actually with our eyes or with camera lenses, we can catch them. We can even, you know, we can count them. We can look at the distances between, between those uh, antenna signals. And we, 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 we can reverse engineer in a way, uh, or we can speculate on what, what is being carried through. Looking at how many cables are going uh, out of that, so we can see, is, is it a strong signal or not? Um, but the other way is also interesting, that the reappropriation that actually we could, we could say, okay, this is now human-created nature, like urban nature, but uh, also nature reappropriating all these tower cells. Like in, in America, you have like lots of ospreys uh, nesting on these GSM towers that became actually a problem for the providers because they are uh, under animal protection, so they can't just uh, um, take off the, the nest. So there's a, this huge fascination of, of us uh, looking at all these technological infrastructures. This is a huge satellite station in, in, in a far away valley in Switzerland. These are some panel antennas you, you, you already have encountered, I guess. It gets interesting when, when they are trying to disguise, obviously, that uh, these ant ant antennas exist. So you, you might uh, see out of a sudden some trees or palms that, uh, that carry um, signals or even lamp posts, so badly in a disguised. badly disguised lamp post, actually a lamp that's just next, uh, the, the, the lamp on the left side is, is not a lamp, it's an antenna post. 
basically they're, they're becoming in part, you know, they're being embedded into our environment. Uh, who created actually, a, you should all follow <laughs> this, this Twitter account uh, who is like actively collecting also all, all weird shapes and um, sorts of antennas. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna round it up here. <laughs>